the news today, the Pentagon will soon have a new way to identify battle casualties accurately. It's a kind of genetic dog tag. All servicemen and women on active duty will be required to deposit blood and saliva samples, which will be frozen and stored in case they are needed to identify a soldier's remains. Ten men allegedly tied to organized crime have been indicted in San Diego. They are charged with trying to take over gambling operations on an Indian reservation. As we reported last month, reservation gambling has become an enormously profitable business. There is so much money involved that investigators believe many tribes are being cheated. Here's ABC's Mort Dean. The indictments were followed quickly by arrests in several states, including Florida. Sam Carlisi, age 70. The FBI says he's a Chicago Mafia boss. Illinois, a reputed Carlisi deputy, Donald Angelini, he's 66. California, Chris Petty, age 64, believed to be the Chicago mob's key operative in San Diego. Previous convictions for laundering drug money and bookmaking. The investigation centered on an alleged plan to skim money from gambling operations at the Rincon Indian Reservation near San Diego. The charges include racketeering, extortion, mail fraud. They were talking about investing as much as $500,000 to get control of this operation. They expected to get that money back and more. High-stakes casino gambling on Indian reservations is growing rapidly. It's now in 24 states. The industry is only loosely controlled by the government's National Indian Gaming Commission. The spectacular expansion of Indian gaming enterprises has created a natural target for organized crime figures and their henchmen. Nine of the ten men indicted today are outsiders, not Indians. Horton Dean, ABC News, New York. A couple of other items from overseas. In London this morning, the Irish Republican Army set off a bomb near 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister's residence. Hundreds of windows were blown out. No one was seriously hurt. And in the Middle East, Israeli warplanes attacked near Beirut today. They say the target was a guerrilla base belonging to the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command. Lebanese police say 12 guerrillas were killed. When we come back, the Denver Broncos. Their fans are actually nervous about success. Before the weekend, there's football news. The Minnesota Vikings of the National Football League have named Dennis Green of Stanford University as their new head coach. He will be only the second black coach in the NFL. It is another big football weekend. The NFL playoffs, it's the Washington Redskins against the Detroit Lions and the Buffalo Bills against the Denver Broncos. ABC's Dick Schaap reports from Denver tonight, where the home team's success is actually viewed as something of a mixed blessing. Here's the snap, the kick is good! The Denver Broncos are just one victory away from going back to the Super Bowl. And their fans are absolutely... Mm, a little ambivalent. I, I'd like to see them get to the Super Bowl, but I doubt if they're going to win. I think people are honestly scared that the Broncos are actually going to go back to the Super Bowl again. <laughs> it's a scary thought. I mean, four disasters, what, one more? There's the rub. Banners hang from the ceiling of the Broncos' headquarters commemorating four conference championships. Handsomely inscribed footballs recall each of those victories. But there isn't a Super Bowl trophy in the house. In their four Super Bowl appearances, the Broncos have lost four times by an average score of 42 to 13. No wonder their fans are wary. They get all pumped up during another Super Bowl, and then, you know, we get beat bad. And, and a lot of the fans, you know, they get hurt by that very, very much so. So they, they don't really want to see it happen again. While the local lunacy called Broncomania, once rampant in the Rockies, is understandably subdued these days, a cartoon in the Rocky Mountain News warns the specter may rise again. Do we want any more uh, national abuse over this? Uh, there is concern that this is what could happen again. The Broncos have taken so much abuse for their Super Bowl flops that the worst nightmare for even their most avid fans is another boring blowout in the Super Bowl. Even the Rockies might crumble. Dick Schaap, ABC News, Denver. Okay, we'll be back in just a moment. World News Tonight with Peter Jennings and the Person of the Week are brought to you by Carnival Cruise Lines. She knows he's out there, obsessed with her every move. Victims of stalkers living in fear of when they'll strike next. Plus, 
Is it right to knowingly pass a physical deformity onto your children? This anchor woman did, and the criticism nearly tore her apart. Bree Walker talks with me on 2020 tonight. Finally this evening, our person of the week. On this Friday night, we have chosen a woman who has spent many years worrying about Saturday morning and all those other times during the week when they say that children own the television set. We choose her because while you may agree with us that television can be a lot better for children than it is now, without this woman, it might well be a lot worse. I feel that in a democracy, when things aren't working right, you have to act to fix them as a citizen. As a citizen who led a group for 23 years to improve the quality of children's television Peggy programs, Charon. Peggy Charon believes she has done what she set out to do. And so action for children's television, Today, ACT as it is usually called, is going out of business. We're going to cease operations by the end of 1992. We, you know, along the way had a pretty good time uh, turning on the system to pay attention. Yay! Kids. Now, for the first time ever, it's a what Peggy Charon got for her efforts was major legislation passed in 1990, which says that broadcasters must limit the number of commercials children are subjected to, and work to offer young viewers educational alternatives to the typical cartoon fare offered them in such large doses. Charon worked long and hard with Congressman Edward Markey of Massachusetts to write the new law. Well, she is the conscience of children's television. In America. She was the vital driving force in creating a national coalition that made it possible for a national piece of legislation to pass. Peggy Charon was born in New York and raised and influenced by a family she calls classically liberal. My family helped me understand from the time I was very little that it wasn't enough just to take care of ourselves, that it was important to cause a democracy to take care of everybody. Everybody, for Peggy Charon, emphasized children. In the 1960s, with television sets so prevalent in America, with children glued to them for as much as five hours a day, no wonder the term electronic babysitter became so popular. Put the kids in front of, you know, what are you doing, kids, watching TV? That's okay, you know, get, get the kids. They're quiet, that's good. But Peggy Charon was one parent who was extremely concerned about what her two children were watching. It was, in those days, wall-to-wall -wall monster cartoons, and I thought we need a little choice for kids. Charon began ACT in her Cambridge, Massachusetts living room in 1968. We were never there to get, um, get terrible programs off television. And what ACT said is you can turn off what's terrible for kids, but you can't turn on what's missing. And if you're licensed to serve the public, you've got to provide what's missing once in a while for our kids. It wasn't only the quality of programs that irked Charon. Television show of its kind. Power on. It was the commercialization. Entire shows that were little more than a sales pitch for toys and breakfast cereals aimed at a very vulnerable audience. It's, it's pretty sad because one in four children in America lives below the poverty line. You know, you don't have any money to be told to buy things all the time. When you turn children's programs into a sales pitch for a product, you are depriving children of the kind of speech they should be hearing, which is just a good story, and you're putting in their consciousness the idea that it's important to have the G.I. Joe toy, My Little Pony. It's really sort of nauseating. We hope that the 60 million Americans who help make this law happen are going to work to promote the programs to their children. And are going to After 23 years of pressure on government and the broadcast industry, and now that the law has been passed, Peggy Charon says it is up to parents and teachers to take up the fight for quality. She will continue as a consultant. Unfortunately, I'm a workaholic, and I am going to work until I drop dead. Uh, and, uh, and I don't envision that anytime soon. What Peggy Charon does envision is the time when those in positions of power and influence in the country will no longer need to be pressured to do what is right by America's children. I think that the fact that, um, that we did manage, after all these years, to get a rule in place that says you have to provide some education programming for children as part of your license responsibility is our major success. Which is why we choose Peggy Charon, the founder of Action for Children's Television. We all know that thanks to television, today's children are exposed to more information than any generation before them. 
Ms. Tarrant has encouraged many of us to pay more attention to the quality of the information we broadcast. That's our report on World News Tonight. I'm Peter Jennings. We hope you have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Good night.